Who do you think decides whether you live or die? Most of you would say it's fate. But in our world, a pandemic-ridden world, it's Big Pharma, a bunch of companies that make vaccines and medicines. They decide who lives and who dies. And that makes them dangerously powerful. Let me explain how. Omicron cases are rising. There is talk of vaccines and boosters. By all indications, booster shots will be a regular feature in our lives. And we know who stands to gain. Big Pharma, they're rolling in money, they're blackmailing governments, they're fueling inequity, they're setting arbitrary terms and conditions, jacking up prices, pushing secret deals, and yet we have little choice but to take their vaccines. That is the kind of power they wield, which is why I say, in today's world, Big Pharma decides whether you live or die. How did they acquire this power? How dangerous can they be? And why is no government stopping them? That's what we'll discuss today. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay and I have some stories for you. We'll start with the story of Martin Shakreli. This man, he used to be America's most hated man. What did he do? Sold this drug, Daraprim, an important weapon in the fight against malaria. Also another serious infection caused by HIV. There was a time when this drug, Daraprim, cost $13.50. Then Martin Shakreli entered the scene. He bought the manufacturing license for Daraprim and jacked up prices by 5,000%. You heard that right, 5,000. So the medicine that sold for $13.50 started selling for $750. People were furious. Patients, doctors, lawmakers, everyone protested. But Shakreli could not care less. I know you're smiling, but I'm very serious, sir. And I truly believe, I truly believe are you listening? Yes. Eventually, the law prevailed. Shakreli was convicted for securities fraud, sent to seven years in jail. Recently, he paid $40 million to settle allegations of price gouging. And this is a man who did not even make drugs for a living. He managed a hedge fund. When asked about the price gouging, he said, I would have raised the prices higher and made more profits. Now, you have to understand where he comes from. As a head fund manager, his primary duty was to make money for his investors. Shakreli was driven by profit. He represented a system, a system that puts profits above lives, a system that wants to make money off illnesses, and a system that influences everyone. I'm talking about Big Pharma. They have unrivaled power, the power to push dangerous drugs into the market, the power to influence politicians and regulators, and the power to maximize profits at the cost of patients. How does Big Pharma do this? With tools like misinformation. Case in point, America's opioid epidemic. What is an opioid? It is a painkiller. It affects you just like heroin. It blocks the feeling of pain, which is why it is habit forming. It's easy to get hooked to opioids. Earlier, doctors in the U.S. kept a tight watch on opioid prescriptions. But in the 1990s, Big Pharma sensed an opportunity. They began pushing an idea, a simple idea. They said, opioids are not addictive. Big Pharma sent sales representatives to doctors across the U.S. Their mission was quite simple. Convince doctors, make them prescribe heavier doses of opioids. The masters of this art were Purdue Pharma. Their opioid drug was called... Oxycontin. Purdue claimed Oxycontin did not cause addiction. It was a lie. Purdue never held a trial to prove Oxycontin was less addictive, and doctors did not bother to check. Here's what happened next. In 1997, doctors were writing 670,000 prescriptions for Oxycontin. By 2002, that number shot up to 6.2 million prescriptions every year. 6.2 million. Nearly 10 times more. Purdue was making money hand over fist. Just one drug, OxyContin, generated more than $30 billion in revenue for this company. Purdue weren't the only ones pushing opioids. Companies like Johnson & Johnson and Teva Pharmaceutical Industries were making opioid drugs too. The crisis reached its peak in 2012. Doctors in the U.S. wrote 255 million prescriptions for opioid pain relievers in one year. Thousands of people got addicted. From 1999 to 2016, more than 450,000 Americans died from opioid overuse. And the crisis is far from over. Nearly 71,000 drug overdose deaths in 2019 involved an opioid. 
Purdue Pharma, the company that fueled this epidemic, got away with a slap on the wrist. When it faced thousands of lawsuits, the company declared bankruptcy. Its owners, the Slacker family, had to pay just a fine. No jail time for fueling an epidemic. Instead, they were given immunity. The Slackers piggybacked off the bankruptcy. Before declaring bankruptcy, in fact, they shifted close to $11 billion in cash out of Purdue. When the settlement was finalized, they paid just $4.5 billion. What a convenient exit. Can it be worse than this? Yes, it can. Big Pharma has the influence to push unproven cures with some help from their regulator friends. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Aduhelm. Last year, the US Food and Drug Administration approved this drug. Aduhelm is made by a company called Biogen. It was sold as a landmark treatment for Alzheimer's. The treatment was introduced at a price of $56,000 a year. Does it even work? There is little evidence that it does. The drug was first assessed by an FDA advisory committee. This committee has 11 members. None of them wanted this drug approved. Now, usually the FDA just goes along with these advisors, but in this case, it did not. To their surprise, Aduhelm was approved. Turns out, Biogen had a close relationship with the FDA. Its officials met with the FDA several times before the decision day, and the drug was approved even though there wasn't enough evidence that it works. What was the rationale behind this approval? It is not clear. Three FDA advisors resigned in protest over the controversial approval. Here is what one of the advisors said about the resignation. I did not think that the firm recommendations from the committee in this case were appropriately integrated into the decision-making process. So instead of listening to its own advisors, did the FDA choose to trust a drug manufacturer? Federal officials have launched an investigation into what really happened. The FDA is supposed to be a watchdog for the pharma industry. Should it maintain such a close relationship with companies, it is supposed to police. The fact is, a large chunk of the FDA's funding comes from the industry. How much? 45% of their entire budget. How can the FDA remain impartial when it is getting paid by big pharma? But American lawmakers are still letting this system continue because Big Pharma has bought influence in the U.S. Congress too. Big Pharma bankrolls American politicians. In the 2020 election, the world's biggest pharma companies wrote checks to 356 lawmakers. As much as $11 million was given out as campaign contribution. More money is being spent on lobbying. In the last 23 years, the pharma and health products industry has spent close to $5 billion on lobbying. And sustained lobbying has its rewards. By law, Big Pharma can set prices off their drugs. There is no scope for negotiation. Big Pharma can charge whatever rates it likes. What happens when some lawmakers try to break this monopoly? Big Pharma strikes back. Look at this. Politicians say they want to negotiate medicine prices in Medicare. But make no mistake. What politicians mean is that they'll decide which medicines you can and can't get. Call Congress. Tell them not to play doctor with your medicine. Paid for by Pharma. Keep the competition out, set the prices of your product, influence policymakers, and hire an army of lawyers and lobbies to fight back any challenge. There is only one business that closely resembles this description. Drug cartels. Drug companies and drug suppliers are operating by a dictionary definition of a cartel. There is no other way to describe them. Big Pharma is the new drug mafia.